Hello, this is the sound of my voice. Can you hear me? Do we yeah. need to be a bit closer? Uh, yeah, move it a bit closer if you can. You want to have like a fist. That's what Joe Rogan says. A fist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to know? Just punching the mic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. That seems good. All right. Um, shall we begin? I mean, I suppose we've already begun, so we'll begin officially. This is the start. This is the start of the podcast. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and welcome to, I said welcome twice, but welcome for a third time. Happy <laughs> number three. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the That Chat That Podcast, joined again by my co-hosts, Keith. Uh, this time we're talking about not urban legends or witches, thank fuck, <laughs> or mad shit. We're talking about real killers and shit like that. That's it. Spooky season's over. They went to real life spooky shit. On one honey, one honey. Yeah, I know. Halloween is over. Autumn's over. Let's get to real, to real murders and uh, spooky shit. Going back from serial killers from today to back in the day and all that. But uh, you know what? You know, um, listen up. I think the fans know that uh, we. I was in Boston for a time. You were here, so we were recording uh, abroad, mm-hmm. separated by thousands of miles, but close in heart. <laughs> uh, so Keith, how you been? How's it feel? Does it feel good to have me back? It does, Don't yeah. Lie. No, it's like, it's great to be back in the old that chapter podcast studio at the top of the Empire State Building. That's it. Yeah, where we're not on a. Uh, on Zoom, I'm physically in the room. Which I know. Is great. I, I can, can reach out and touch you. Smell your pheromones. Nearly, nearly. <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to be back. It's good to be back to actually have a proper recording stuff set up and you know actual audio quality and stuff. And I'm not recording off my iPhone, which is literally <laughs> why the last two episodes I was recording off because I did not have a fucking microphone. I was like, an iPhone microphone will do, and it turns out it does not do. <laughs> but you know what? It's all good. Um, you still a bit jet lagged? Very jet lagged. Yeah. Jet lag. It's the son of a gun. I'll tell you that for free. Yeah, I keep waking up. I can't go to sleep till like 5 a.m. and I wake up at like mad hours. It sucks. I hate it. And there's nothing I can do. Uh, you said it great when we were texting the other day. It's like, ah, oh, I'll try and drink. I'll get myself so drunk I'll collapse. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, that'll clear my hangover. I'll force yeah. myself to go to sleep yeah. via my good friend, Mr. Alcohol. Mm-hmm. Nope. Turns out I get like an hour of sleep and then I wake up hungover at like two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it didn't work for me either. Like on my flight back. Uh, also, I think I picked a really bad seat. I picked a window seat, which mm-hmm. I thought would be great. But then there was a guy sitting beside me. And then you have to go to use the bathroom and stuff. Straight away, the guy was like, he put on his eye mask, he put on headphones, he put a blanket on, pulled the seat right back and just KO'd. So I was like, I was drinking wine, trying to get as like drunk as I could to pass out and fall asleep. And I was like, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. And I was trying to wake this guy up. Are you trying to like Spider-Man over him? Yeah, so I tried to wake him up. And I was like, he's not getting up. So all right, I'll try and just like stand over him. Yeah. So then like I stood over him with one leg. And that was the moment he decided to wake up. Peek through the eye mask, you know, to be straddling. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Your cock is in his face. <laughs> yeah. 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 This isn't what it looks like. <laughs> in the dark on the plane, I was like, I'm so sorry, go back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mind me. But then, uh, yeah, then after I was like, okay, I'm going to stop drinking because I'm going to have to keep going to the bathroom. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, then I kind of, like you, fell asleep for maybe half an hour, then woke up and got to enjoy the hangover awake. So mm-hmm. it was... Uh, Delightful. Yeah, I could feel it, the hangover seeping in as the drunkest... I know, it sucks. Day. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. You just have to grin and bear it. Well, uh, as well, it's been a while since we talked about it because we have... Oh, yeah, another thing is that people are always asking, when are we going to see Keith? When are we going to see Keith? Especially because I was talking about it. You'll see him when you're... I'm fucking good and ready this way. <laughs> That's when you'll see him. <laughs> The more you ask, the less you're going to see him. That's, I'm at that point now. I'm sick and tired of this pro Keith fucking propaganda bullshit. Also, it's not that it's not that exciting. I'm just going to put up a picture of you. I'm not even going to fucking. I think we've built it up so much that people are going to be so disappointed. We haven't even built it up. We just decided not to show you, and I think it's gotten to such a stage that people are going to be so fucking disappointed when they see you. It's they true. actually might just unsubscribe from the it's podcast. True. Every time I look in the mirror, I go, ugh, you I again. Know. <laughs> I know, I look, I'm going right now, like g- gagging, just looking yeah. at me. <laughs> this guy again? But uh, yeah, Keith will appear. Uh, I genuinely think we should just post a picture and be like, hey, this is Keith. Yeah. And just picture yeah. you like taking a shit or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> I think that's the best way to introduce you. But I know he will be in a video. We, we Keith, um, while I was in Boston, Keith came over and we went to Salem and we filmed some stuff. There's another video I want to do on Salem. So I've already I've already put out one video, and that was more of a Halloween themed video. Next, I want to make another video about Salem, but just like history and all the creepy shit that's happened there. Not necessarily the witch shit, but because there's been a lot of really interesting like murders and shit that's happened there. So Keith was there, and we we did it all, didn't we, Keith? Every single thing we did. Salem's not huge, so we got yeah. like we were. I think we were there for a day and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we got it all done. We did. Um, my my dogs were barking at the end. I'll tell you, uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Really, <laughs> 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 
Definitely barking. Um, but yeah, yeah. And uh, another thing, uh, what's the story with your haunted house? It's been a while since I asked you about it. It has, you know, it's it's, it's been quite kind of hoping with like the ho- with Halloween and stuff. I was like preparing myself for some spooky stuff, but no, it's been it's been quiet. Maybe the ghost taking a little break. But last we heard is that they were saying "mama" mm. to you on the last episode. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't heard any more voices, thank God, because that was a uh, that was really fucking creepy. That is very fucking creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah didn't they? Things got real then. I was like, mm-hmm. ooh, no, this isn't actually fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> you take, take more uh, videos and shit and I'll put it all up on Instagram. Even though I keep saying I'm going to do it, I will actually do it. You know, you should, you should get a, set up a time lapse in your place. Like a oh, yeah. film trip tonight, like a night camera or whatever. That's a good idea. Yeah, because I, I feel it's like the house itself is actually fine. Like downstairs is grand, but the attic is definitely, there's a, there's a weird feeling in the attic. But uh, it's strange. And, yeah. I think we already briefly talked about this. I'm not sure if it was on mic, but um, I really want to record an episode from your attic. Yeah, we'd even we could even video it, like uh, just record it. Um, I think that'd be really really cool. Yeah, we'll do we'll do it over the uh, we'll do it over the old Christmas period. Yeah, let's record an episode. We talk about like some serial killer or something. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And we'll we'll film it as well. We can do a video and put it on the channel YouTube okay. channel. Yeah, that's good. That'd be cool. Yeah. That's All right. Go. Let's do that. Done. So. All right. Is this one of the things we say we're going to do but never actually do? No, we'll do it. We'll do yeah, it. Okay, we will yeah. Do it. Yeah. Okay. We will do it. We'll do it. Okay. I'm psyched. <laughs> Uh, all right, that's still all the bullshit out of the way. Now let's get to the story. Today we're talking about Mel Ignato. He's a real bastard. So that's kind of all we need to know before we get into it. So let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. This old one takes us to Kentucky, Louisville. By the way, if anybody fucking tries to correct my pronunciation of Louisville, you can fuck off. <laughs> because I, every time I do a story set there, they're all over me about, no, it's, some people say it's Louisville or Louisville or Louisville or Louis. I, like, seriously, it's crazy. There's like yeah. 10 different pronunciations. I would have said Louisville, but I know that's not right. And you know what? If you have a problem with every Louis, no, it's definitely Louisville or Louisville. Yeah, maybe that. You maybe. know what? You can say Lo- Louisville. I'd say Louisville. How about we just say that? And if anybody has a problem, they can just lick our balls. Let's just say Kentucky. And that is where Brenda Sue Schaefer and Melvin Henry Ignato met on a blind date in September 1986. The date was arranged by the boyfriend of Brenda's best friend, her best friend being Joyce Smallwood. Melvin, known as Mel, now he was far from Brenda's usual type, so it's a bit weird to be set up with this guy on a blind date. He was 14 years older than she was, he was 50, and she didn't find him like that at all physically attractive, like he wasn't a terribly good looking guy. But those things were low on the priority list for Brenda when it came to finding love. She was far more drawn to the fact Mel seemed completely enamored with her and there was no doubt he could provide a good life for her. Their first date was a couple's date with Joyce and her boyfriend, Bob Davis. The two couples spent the date on Ignato's boat, which is like, all right, I mean, he's got a boat, like, so. Yeah, you can't say no on a boat. No, we can't say, uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? <laughs> She's not going to say no. She would never say no because of the implication. And then he invited Brenda back to the boat again the next night for a second date. Now, Brenda, she was a very attractive woman, but she lacked confidence, especially when it came to her sexuality. Her ex-boyfriend had remarked on her timidity when it came to anything slightly spicy in the bedroom when they were together. Her timidity was at least in part due to her strict religious upbringing. Brenda would struggle with her faith and the consequences of it for most of her adult life. Like many, she found it hard to reconcile her faith and the ability to enjoy some more earthly pleasures. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Melvin, though, he was the opposite. He was a real horn dog. He was a raw dogger. He was, in fact, into some of the more extreme activities in the bedroom. He got off on a degradation and domination in the bedroom. Yeah, you get, it's, it's not a great mix when you got someone who's still finding their feet, discovering what they even like. Uh, and then you got Melvin who's like into the ball gags and whips and, the, and, and all that kind of stuff. Brenda was also drawn to Mel's seeming stability. Her previous relationships, including her failed marriage, had in part ended because of drinking and financial irresponsibility, respectively. Regardless of her doubts, Brenda was eventually convinced to accept Melvin's proposal, and the two went from casual dating to engaged very quickly. Valentine's Day 1987 was when Mel proposed with a big old rock of a diamond. Now, there is no doubt that Brenda was at least a little materialistic, but she was also carrying scars from her earlier relationships that she just didn't know how to deal with in a healthy way. It's interesting how um, 
Brenda was such a strict Catholic and had such like Catholic guilt. As I said, wasn't able to enjoy the simple pleasures or these earthly pleasures, but still went ahead and divorced her first marriage, which as we know is a, a big no-no in the Catholic church. But it kind of shows just how bad it must have been for her to take such a big step. And then after her first marriage, she went out with a man named Jim Rush, who I know we'll bring up again a little later in the story, but these two, they went out for years and they were madly in love with each other. But unfortunately, Jim's drinking problem was just too much for Brenda. And mm-hmm. that led to the complete breakdown in the relationship, which devastated Brenda. Yeah. By all accounts, because of these, the divorce and then the breakup of from the love of her life, she was in a very, very vulnerable state when L. Melvin came along. Yeah, yeah. And he was able to woo her very exactly. easily, I'm sure. And that's, like, so, some people said that Melvin, he like he had he had a bit of charm, but uh, most thought he was just a plain old weirdo. Yeah. Just uh, creeping it real, you know? Mm-hmm. There was a book about this case called Double Jeopardy. And in it, it explains uh, that Brenda's friend, Joyce Smallwood, he, she wasn't a fan of Ignito at all. I wonder why she introduced them then. If she Like they were set up by Joyce. I think it was it was uh, it was her boyfriend. Ah, uh, uh, right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob Davis. Yes, yeah, yeah. So Smallwood said that uh, she saw him as a bit of a con artist, spinning tales about working for the CIA, mm-hmm. having a stash of three hundred thousand in uh, in in China, and having escapades with prostitutes. <laughs> escapades. I love that. I'm gonna uh, go have a good old esca- <laughs> escapade with <laughs> some prostitutes. I'll be right back. <laughs> Wink. He was a bullshitter. So, and like, but a, aside from this type of teenage bravado bragging, he also didn't shy away from throwing around immature and crude sexual talk in yeah. just his day-to-day conversations, which Smallwood said that she just really didn't appreciate at all. So, for example, the name of his boat that you mentioned, it was named the Motion Lotion. And he once told a female friend that she needed to sexercise to lose some extra weight. Nice. So, you know, just a, a, re- a real classy guy. Yeah. And then he also uses terms like escapades. Where escapades. Prostitutes <laughs> and sex <laughs> yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm going to have some escapades with my hand hey. after this podcast is done, if you know what I'm saying. Hey. Hey. El, uh, El Pamela and, hey. her, and her five friends. <laughs> All right. So let's see where this uh, healthy relationship between Mel and Brenda will go. Hint, hint. No, we're fucking good. <laughs> the happy times didn't last long. In fact, almost as soon as the two were engaged, about a year after their first meeting, Brenda began to have serious doubts about Mel. She told family and friends that Mel was controlling and often cruel and abusive towards her. Throughout the course of the relationship, Brenda had confided in not only her ex, Jim Rush, but also her brother Tom's girlfriend, Linda Love. And then, of course, Joyce Smallwood, one of the friends who'd first introduced them. Like, a lot of people knew Mel was kind of a piece of shit, as you also mentioned. Joyce knew very well because of his constant lies. Linda and Joyce later told investigators that Brenda told them both on separate occasions that she was very uncomfortable with everything about her sexuality and sex in general. It intimidated her. Mel was completely ignorant of Brenda's feelings and would often talk very explicitly about his fantasies. Although I'm not even sure if he's ignorant, I think he probably just did not give a two pony fuck about whatever she thought. He was like, yeah. Mel's way or the highway. Yeah, the Mel that. dog is in charge now. <laughs> now, some of it was perfectly fine around a mill, you know, kinky bondage stuff, but some of it, bearing in mind that good old missionary terrified Brenda, some of what he was into was close to illegal. Brenda was never 100% comfortable, but wanted Mel to be happy. Eventually, Mel told Brenda he could get a hold of what he called sex tablets that would help Brenda get in the mood. He's such, he's such an asshole. <laughs> he managed to persuade her to give him a try, and well, they were just roofies. Like, it was literally, he literally just drugged her, and that was it. Yeah. Brenda told Linda Love that she would take the tablets and then wake up naked with no recollection of what had happened. Um, which is especially fucked up. Well, first of all, just the kind of person who would roofie somebody else, and then also when the somebody else is your wife, I think that kind of makes it even extra fucked up. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly fucked up. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I know, dr- drugging someone like this, it kind of, like, so they're totally immobilized. Yeah. I know, it kind of feels like borderline necrophilia. necrophilia. Yes. Yeah, ne- I was yeah. thinking the same thing. It's yeah. like, you want to have sex with, essentially it's just a body. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I know they're still living, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not far from necrophilia. I, I, I think there's loads of, there's different, like, subgenres. Of necrophilia. Ah, tell me more, Keith. I you seem to be such an expert in this. Uh, how do I? I'm not too versed. Oh, okay, right. Let, just I'll, I'll pretend you're just making this up and you don't actually know what you're talking okay, about. Okay, okay. Yeah. I 
From what I've heard, uh, no, I, I think there's, like, there's, there's different like genre uh, subcategories or genres. It's, it's it's all very hipster. Okay. Of uh, the necrophilia world, wow. but uh, I think one of like the lowest rung of this paraphilia is um, someone who's attracted to someone who's pretending to be dead. Okay. You know, so but they don't want to actually have sex with a dead body. They want their partner to pretend that they're dead. So they'll like either have them get like a, re- a really cold bath beforehand, <laughs> yeah. or they'll like they'll put a tag on it's their toe. Stand outside. I've had a tag on their toe. <laughs> a tag on their toe and oh cover himself with a sheet. God. You know, uh, actually, cover himself in like honestly, white makeup. That's pretty fucking funny. Yeah, yeah, that is quite funny. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's still kind of a bit red flagish, you know. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I say it's that. hard to find someone that's interested. In yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to be like all Mel and get yourself one of them Brenda's. That's get one of those sex tablets. That's what you yeah, need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I think all that kind of makes it clear. Mel only saw women as objects there to give him pleasure and their satisfaction, even their happiness, well, actually didn't even come anywhere. She was already considering leaving him. And when I say considering, she'd basically made up her mind and was going to end the relationship. Mel, on the other hand, was more than happy with Brenda and he thought everything was, was grand. So, when he cut wind that Brenda was not happy and wanted to end things, he was absolutely fucking shit furious. He was mad as hell. He was so angry, he called up his ex-girlfriend, Mary Ann Shore. Now, calling up an ex at the end of a relationship is not that uncommon, but Mel didn't call up old Mary Ann because he wanted to rekindle an old flame. He wasn't looking for a rebound. What he wanted in Mary was an accomplice. Nice. Mary was, she was really, well, okay, it's okay, it's okay to say it because she was a piece of shit. She was, un, she was unattractive. Oh, she's uh, ugly? She's yeah. ugly? She wasn't, yeah, she wasn't good looking. Um, but uh, she was extremely desperate for attention as well. Oh, you're not kidding, by the way. Sorry, I just brought up. Yeah. Wow. Right? She's <laughs> fucking legend of the dog-faced woman over here. <laughs> Jesus. It, it, it's okay to say this because of what she does later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Folks, I'm not trying to be mean here to make fun of somebody's appearance, but you should... When you hear what I'm about to tell you, you'll be very happy with me making yeah. fun of her appearance. <laughs> but uh, what, while they were together, Mel knew of her need for attention and all this. And he, he really played on her insecurities. Um, Mary was one of the, the lucky ones who received sexercise sessions in order to remove her fatty tissue. Didn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> she needed more sexercise. <laughs> but uh, Mel, he would also give Mary uh, multiple choice quizzes to reveal her sexual pre- preferences and also tell erotic stories, which is so weird. In the end, Mel, he, he just didn't want her. Um, he was only interested in her for sex, so he broke up with her. And Mary, she was extremely jealous of Mel and Brenda's relationship. She was, she, she was basically, Brenda was everything that Mary wasn't. And she was desperate to, to get Mel back. So when Mel reached out to her, um, she just jumped at the opportunity. She was delighted. She was like, absolutely, whatever you want, I'll yeah. do it. I know, Mel's kind of like a real life Dan- Dennis Reynolds. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think he gives a shit about any women who are not. He just, they're just, you know, objects to him. Yeah, yeah. for sure. What happens next sounds kind of like Dennis takes it too far. <laughs> you know, the gang <laughs> takes it too far. And I mean, I'm sure when Mary heard about what Mel's plan was, she was even happier. Because what happened next and what they did to Brenda, um, it's pretty pretty gross like it's very cold-blooded disgusting uh really really bad so mel he was reunited with his former lover and this time mel decided to let all his inner demons out and he sat down with mary ann shore and a yellow legal pad and he listed out in complete detail exactly what he wanted to do to brenda his own wife now the exercise was far from some twisted form of post-breakup therapy it was a to-do list Over the next few weeks, completely unbeknownst to Brenda, Mel and Mary set about checking off items from the preparations section of his list. That included digging a deep grave in the woods behind Mary's house, and the pair even scream tested Mary's home, which is every bit as messed up as it sounds. Mel would literally stand in the road outside the house, and Mary would scream at the top of her lungs so they would know if Brenda's screams would be heard later on. On the 23rd of September 1988, they were finally done with their plans and they put them into action. Now, it's also worth noting here that at no point did Mary think this was some kind of messed up game or some kind of role play. She knew this is no mucking about. This is the real deal. Well, maybe if there was scream test and maybe she thought it was for a surprise party. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, mm-hmm. But then why the grave, Mel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is where we're going to keep the presents, obviously. <laughs> ah, of course, of course. <laughs> so that evening, the 23rd of September, Mel told Brenda that Mary wanted to see her jewelry on the pretense of buying it. Brenda had thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, and that would actually end up being a vital part of of future investigations. 
So Mel waited until Brenda's guard was down, she was preparing her jewelry, and then he took the opportunity to pull a gun on her and she became his prisoner. He put the heat to her head and he said, you're coming with me, tying her hands behind her back, binding her feet, before he stuffed her into the trunk of his car and took her to Mary's house. Once there, uh, what happened next can be described as only a complete uh, nightmare. So I, this is one of those times I don't often put trigger warnings in videos and in the podcasts because I mean it's a true crime podcast. You, you, I mean I always kind of feel like you kind of know what you're getting. This time I will put in a trigger warning. Like it is pretty graphic. Uh, this part I'm not going to go into it too much. I won't go into the lurid ins and outs because it's pretty gross. Uh, but at the same time, I can't just, I don't think it's fair to downplay the evil of Mel Ignato and the suffering that Brenda Schaefer endured to dismiss it that she, we can't just say, she was tortured and then murdered. It's yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. There, was a little, there was a lot more to it that. So, at the house, Mel forced Brenda to strip off. He then took her into each room of the house where he beat her and forced her to pose in sexually explicit ways, beginning by tying her up and assaulting her on the glass coffee table in Mary's front room. Throughout the ordeal, Mary followed the pair, and at Mel's command, she photographed each position and violation of Brenda Schaefer. Occasionally, Mel would tell Mary to join in with Brenda's torment. Together, they beat, humiliated, raped, and sodomized Brenda Schaefer. All of this because she simply just wanted to end the relationship. After hours of the most sickening and brutal torment any person could be made to endure, Mel asked Mary to get him something from the kitchen. After a couple of minutes, Mel joined Mary in the kitchen, and he told her it was over. He told her he'd strangled Brenda, and she was dead. In reality, Mel used chloroform to finish her off. So I, d I don't think it's really possible to come up with a more undeserved fate than that than the one Brenda met that evening. It's pretty it's pretty horrible. Um, and yeah, when she was dead, her kidnappers and torturers turned murderers carried her body out to the woods where they had a pre-dug grave at the back of Mary's house. Once she was buried, Melvin and Mary went about their business as usual as though nothing had happened, let alone having just committed one of the most savage murders ever. Oh, and this all happened on what would have been Mel and Brenda's second anniversary of when they first met. God, it's, all, it's fucked up, isn't it? Yeah, it's really dark. Also, it's like, I guess it's kind of worth noting as well that chloroform doesn't work the same way that it does in the movies. Shocking, mm. I know. So in in the films, simply waving a soaked rag of chloroform is enough to knock someone out. But in reality, that's not the case. Yeah. I read up a little bit about it and there was this uh, Lancet Medical Journal and it says that only the right dose of chloroform soaked in a rag along with five minutes of persistence mm. would knock someone out. It takes a long time, yeah. It does, yeah. It's yeah. not like an Acer Enchiro. But uh, like you know, it's still it's still a very very dangerous and volatile and unpredictable liquid. Like you shouldn't mess around with it. You can still it can still kill you. Yeah. But all this to say, I think sadly in her final moments, it's likely that Brenda wasn't just quickly knocked out. Instead, it's probably she endured suffocation, which mm -hmm. is just a horrendous way to die. Of course, from the very next day, Brenda was notably absent and uncontactable. Now she wasn't the kind of person at all to like not get in touch. Get in touch if she was planning on being out of contact, especially with her mother and her brother Tom. And it was her mother, Essie, and father, John, who first raised the alarm that Brenda was missing. Brenda's brother, Tom, went to the St. Matthews Police Department to report her missing on the evening of the 24th of September, 1988, which was the day after she was killed. And the next morning, Brenda's 1984 Buick Regal was found abandoned on the westbound lane of Interstate 64. The car had been broken into and the radio was missing. There was also what appeared to be small splatters of blood on the back seat. Detectives immediately knew they needed to treat this as more than a run-of-the-mill missing persons case. Now, Brenda's parents, Essie and John, they contacted Brenda's ex-boyfriend, Jim Rush, to help search for her when she first went missing. Jim had actually been in touch recently with Brenda as she'd been using him as a sanding board for all the shit she was going through with Mel and had informed him she was in the process of splitting up with him, divorcing him, and had actually been going to meet up with him soon to exchange some items for one another's on the evening she disappeared. And during the two-year relationship with Melvin, Brenda worked as a secretary and assistant for a dentist named Dr. William Spaulding. In fact, she'd worked for him for 10 years when she met Melvin. She'd worked for him for 12 years by the time she went missing. Dr. William Spaulding hated Melvin, hated him with a passion. He'd instantly seen through Melvin's outward veneer of respectability, and he absolutely detested him for the way Melvin treated Brenda. Unlike Melvin, 
William also got on very well with the whole Schaefer family, and they liked him in return. Honestly, it seems like William was actually probably a little bit in love with Brenda. He was our boss, but it seems like he had a bit of a crush on her. And so then, when she went missing, William, well, he knew exactly where to go. He had Melvin's number from the second he heard no one could find her. And it ate away at him. He knew Melvin had done something to Brenda, and he was getting away with it. It got to him so deeply that he eventually decided he had to do something about it. Now, William wasn't a violent man, though, so he wasn't going to physically confront him and beat the shit out of him. Instead, he chose to use his smarts and a serious threat of violence to try and pressure Melvin into saying what had actually happened. So what Dr. William Spaulding decided to do was send Melvin an anonymous letter threatening Melvin's life if he didn't tell the truth. Uh, unfortunately for William, he'd told his own lawyer of his intentions, though, before sending it. So Melvin got this anonymous letter and he took the threat at face value and he milked it for everything it was worth. He demanded protection from the police, which was given. In fact, Melvin was literally given a SWAT team to protect him. This led to Dr. William Spaulding eventually outing himself, saying, okay, I sent the letter. He'd grown terrified of Melvin and even took to carrying a firearm in case Melvin came for him. That actually got him into trouble and he was dismissed from work for bringing a gun in with him and he was arrested and charged with the threat on Melvin's life. Melvin was called to testify against him at his trial, and in a lovely piece of fuck you irony, the decision to testify against William would later come back to bite Melvin in the ass many years later, but we will get that. Melvin was a real dickhead, and he was going to press all charges against William for threatening him for sending that letter. So during his testimony, Melvin was questioned about the state of his relationship with Brenda, which he described as being happy and content. It was great. There was just no way Brenda was planning on breaking up with him, and the doctor was just jealous of his relationship with Brenda. Spaulding was sentenced to three years in prison. It likely would have been a lot more had it not been obvious to the jury that he had no intention of following through in the threats and just wanted to find Brenda. Mel, by the way, was saying the whole time she just took off and left him. Don't know where she went. Now, pretty much everyone had Mel Ignato pegged as the reason for Brenda's disappearance, including the lead detective in the case, Jefferson County Police Detective Jim Wesley. Everybody knew Mel had done something to her, that she hadn't just run off. Wesley interviewed Ignato about Brenda and got a story about the two having driven around in her car and then dropping him off at home and Brenda drove off herself. Now, small details, though, seem to make no sense to Wesley. For example, Mel told him that they'd driven around in Brenda's car because he was having trouble with a tire on his own Corvette. But he'd been seen driving it before and immediately after Brenda disappeared. And it was little things like that that rattled detectives like Wesley and put them on the right trail. Wesley disliked Ignato from the start. He even noted that Mel would insist on calling the detective Jim and acting like they were best friends. Basically, everyone knew it was Mel including the mayor of Louisville, but there was little to no hard evidence linking him to Brenda's disappearance and whatever actually happened to her. I don't know if Mel called Detective Wesley by his first name as a way of acting like best buds. Uh, to me, it kind of seems more he was using his familiarity to belittle the detective and project a sense of, like, you know, superiority mm, over him. Sounds like Mel. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the detectives, they didn't like him at all, mm -hmm. from start to said. Uh, we Wesley felt that Mel knew a lot more than he was letting on. Mel, he also tried to really control any police or FBI interview by asking way more questions than he was answering. He was obviously just like probing. He wanted to know what the police knew, mm -hmm. make sure that he was like in the clear. Yeah, yeah. So he knew he knew which way the investigation was going. He wanted to be in charge at all times. Mm, He's a very yeah. controlling person. Yes, yeah. But the apparent breakthrough for Jefferson County Police came on the afternoon of January 9th, 1990. That's a year and a bit when uh, Mel Ignato was walking around whistling fucking happiest mm. guy in the town yeah, yeah. Uh, while everybody's freaking out and nobody knows what happened to Brenda. Mary Ann Shore and her lawyer, they wanted to talk to the police. A few hours later, and Mary had told them every single thing, from the planning and screen testing to the torture of Brenda and her murder. She'd broken down completely and gave them every detail, including telling them about taking the photos of what exactly they were doing to Brenda. And she had taken a lot of photos. Unfortunately for them, Mary, though, was also known to tell a few, few porky pies and clearly had a grievance with Mel. The grievance being, she was in love with Mel. She didn't like him dumping her. She hated that he'd gotten with Brenda. And then after he had used Mary to help kill Brenda, he probably threw her away again. She also didn't know where the photographs that she had taken had actually ended up. 
Mel probably destroyed them as soon as the police came sniffing around. They really needed something solid. Mary agreed to wear a wire and talk to Mel about the body. She arranged a meeting with him and the two met at a car park where she managed to get him to talk about the case, but the audio wasn't very listenable. So initially, the plan they were that they were going to go with was they were going to meet in Mary's apartment and Wesley was going to hide in the closet <laughs> and come out <laughs> and <laughs> arrest Mel as soon as he confessed. Which, you know, as far as plan goes, as, as far as plans Pretty go, solid. it also sounds like they literally just went with the very first idea that was thrown out. It was like, yep, yeah, mm, that'll loot. That's lunch. Good. I like it, dude. But uh, yeah, in, in the end, Mel, he was he was worried that uh, Mary's apartment would, would be bugged, which is actually a far better idea than hiding in the closet. But um, so that's when they decided to go to a ice cream parking lot. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that it was the, the, the detectives that decided to meet in the parking lot. You know, like, all right, boys, we're going to go in. We're going to get a confession. And then after, banana splits all around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ice cream for everybody! <laughs> Yay. Despite a search of the rear of Mary Shore's property turning up nothing, which is where she had been buried, and the audio of the conversation being, well, not very good, Detective Jim Wesley decided they would go ahead and arrest Mel Ignato. And when he was arrested, his mother, Virginia, immediately called Mel's lawyer, Charlie Ricketts, and had him guide them through what to do. It was the right move, as the very next day, with the help of cadaver dogs, Brenda's body was indeed found right where it had been buried behind Mary's house. Mel was held on $500,000 bond, and his house was raided. Inside, they found a dirty shovel, a fraternity paddle, and a camera with film in it. But sadly, not the film they were looking for. The camera did match Mary's description of the one she had used to take pictures of the torture of Brenda, but it didn't have didn't have any pictures on. The film was not what they were looking for. Mm. Do you know when uh, when Brenda's body was pulled up, it was folded over and tied inside of a garbage bag. Wow. So it just it really just shows how little Mel actually thought of her. Mm -hmm. Luckily for Mel, though, he had one hell of a lawyer. Charlie Ricketts was an ex-Fed and former president of the Louisville Bar Association. Mel Ignato was known to Ricketts from an earlier run-in with the law back in 1984, when Mel had been slapped with a 30-day prison sentence and a $2,500 fine for tax evasion. He managed to keep his job as a salesman at the time by telling his boss that he was on an extended vacation, which is, I think, is the best thing to do. If you're ever in jail for a short thing, hey, I'm on holidays. Mel even sent his boss a letter from prison saying he wished he could be there with him where his vacation was taking place. <laughs> it's I love that. It's absolutely amazing. Like, yeah, what a cover. Obviously, like Mel, he's he's obviously a piece of shit, but, you know, credit that's, where credit is due. That's, that's, that's that brilliant. That is yeah. gold. That's comedy gold, Mel. <laughs> Chef's kiss. Yeah. Brilliant. So a grand jury indicted Mel Ignato on charges of murder, kidnapping, sodomy, sexual abuse, robbery, and tampering with evidence. Mary Ann Shore was indicted only on a charge of tampering with evidence. And due to all the media attention the case had received in Louisville, Ricketts requested a change of venue to avoid a biased jury. The request was granted, and the eventual trial was moved to Covington, Kentucky. It took almost two years to get Mel Ignato to trial, and when they got him there, it didn't go well. Even though they had Mary readily confessing to her role in the crime and giving them an eyewitness account, she did not make her the best or most reliable witness. She even turned up to court for her testimony in a miniskirt and tons of makeup. It wasn't only her physical appearance that made her a bad, bad witness for the prosecution. She literally was having a great time. She was smile, she had a big shit eating grin on her face the whole way, she was grinning, she was laughing through the testimony, and her account of the horrific torture Mel had inflicted. She thought it was, it was comedy gold what he was doing. Her deal with the prosecution, she would only face the charge of evidence tampering in return for her witness testimony against Mel, and that was used against her by the defense. Charlie Ricketts managed to make it seem like she was simply jealous, and that Mary had killed Brenda herself in order to blame Mel for it. Even the recording of the conversation between Mary and Mel didn't hold up against old Charlie Ricketts. Thanks in part to the poor quality of the recording, he managed to make it appear to the audience that Mel hadn't actually been talking about a body at all. In fact, according to Mel and Ricketts, he'd been talking about a safe the two had buried in order to hide some stolen jewellery. In all, the jury heard the prosecution and defence go back and forth for 11 days. And despite quite a lot of evidence against him, Mel was found not guilty of the murder of Brenda Schaefer. Charlie Ricketts later admitted that if he had known Mel was guilty, he probably wouldn't have done as good a job as he actually did. 
which is a lie because he's a lawyer. When I read this first one's going through, I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, he got away with it. But like, even though Mel received a like a not guilty ver- verdict, it doesn't really imply that the jury believed that he was innocent of Brenda's mur- murder. Not guilty, it just simply indicates that there wasn't sufficient re- evidence. Reasonable doubt, that's, that's it. You exactly, know? yeah, and this was precisely yeah. the focus of Ricketts' argument. In his opening statement, Ricketts, he'd, ar- he'd argued that there was no tangible evidence connecting Mel Ignato to Brenda's murder. There was no fingerprints, there was no pubic hair, no blood, semen or abrasions that could link him to the crime. He did highlight the vandalism of the car, but he suggested that those responsible for the vandalism might have moved the vehicle, not Ignato. So Ricketts, he also drew attention to the external pressure exerted by the public and also the media on the police to identify a a suspect. He specifically mentioned Brenda's employer, Dr. Spaulding, Mm -hmm. uh, portraying him as a possessive and jealous individual. And uh, yeah, with all this, unfortunately, Ricketts, he was he was a very skilled lawyer and effectively introduced these points to install reasonable doubt, as you mentioned, in the minds of the jury. So he's a piece of shit. I'm sure he came across as a piece of shit. But at the same stage, like, there's not enough evidence there. Yeah, to, to yeah. Him. I mean, it's all down to the letter of the law. That's it. You know, it's like you have to find him guilty beyond reasonable doubt. And yeah. And so it appeared that Mel had literally gotten away with murder. And he walked out of that courthouse a very happy man. Whistling like he had been for the year and a quarter while she was missing before he was even charged. That is, until a stroke of luck, roughly six months later. And that was brought about by Mel's legal bills. You see, Mel... He wasn't doing well financially and had lost his longtime sales job in order to pay Charlie Ricketts, who did not work for very cheap. And so he had to sign over his home, which Charlie would then sell on to a couple named Watkins. The Watkins were not fond of the interior of the drab chocolate brown house and decided they'd give it a bit of a dress up. They were like, you know, this is in the October of 1992. You need some cool 90s fashion decor. What's what's 90s decor? Um... Jurassic Park posters. Jurassic Park posters. Indiana Jones posters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what are ninety. Uh, lots of like. I lived in the nineties. I was some like. I know. I don't know what it looked like. I I, I had a wicker couch. Does that count? I don't know. Uh, Maybe we were just so. perfect. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so in the October of nineteen ninety two, they had their contractors in for the first time, and they proceeded about their business. One of the first things they did was rip up the old carpeting. And that revealed an old air vent, which had previously been hidden. Interesting. The air vent contained a zipped up storage bag with three rolls of undeveloped film, as well as all of Renda Schaefer's missing jewelry, which is a ring and necklace and a tennis bracelet. Now, the contractor didn't know anything about the house belonging to Mel, and so he contacted the Watkins and told them about the shit he'd found. The Watkins, they knew exactly who had owned this house previously, and they picked up the phone and called the FBI right away. They knew Mel Ignato used to own the house and they knew all about the Brenda Schaefer case. Everybody did. They also thought Mel had gotten away with murder. I'm not sure if Mel was like that stupid that he forgot all the stuff hidden in the house or he was just that arrogant. And he was Mm -hmm. just like, you know, fuck it. If they find it, what are they gonna do? I'd say, yeah, he didn't give a shit. I'd say he was like, oh, I've already gotten away with murder. Double jeopardy, they can't charge me with it. And like, um, he got off on it. Yeah, yeah. you know. He, yeah. he probably felt it was like, I, you know, controlling or something like, oh, yeah. I've got a bit of bit of murder in the murder. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm inside. You know, I don't know. Yeah, something yeah. weird like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. His dirty secret is under their feet. Yeah. Maybe that's not spend too long trying to get into the mind of a murder. No, let's spend it. Let's spend about it. Yeah. I need to really, it. truly get inside. Keith, we need to commit click a murder. the door is locked. You are not going home tonight. <laughs> We're going to have some escapades tonight. Have you not you. been wearing pants the whole time? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> The first thing, oh, your boy is hard over here. I'm always hard. <laughs> always ready. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to have one of those cock rings. But one of the cock rings that goes around your balls, too. <laughs> Why she would have stood up and I had that? It would be pretty funny. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the first thing the FBI did was develop the film. And what they received back from the lab, well, the film showed exactly what Mary had told him it would. Though his face was never visible, anyone who knew Mel could clearly recognize him as being the man in the photographs. Forensic experts even managed to match the body hair patterns of the man in the photographs with Mel. He must have been a very hairy man if you can match the patterns of his body hair with like, Right, must yeah. Must have like swirls and like yeah. one of those bear motherfuckers. Just has like a really weird parting. Or he has yeah. like a bald spot which he combed with one side of his back hair. Yeah. <laughs> He's cover it up. over yeah. on his back. Yeah. Yeah. The comb over back hair. Yeah. <laughs> 
There are a total of 112 photographs, with each one getting progressively worse and worse, and they showed every step of Brenda Schaefer's last moments. They now knew 100%, way beyond any reasonable doubt, that Mel did, in fact, kill Brenda. Only, they had already tried him for the crime and he had been acquitted. Double jeopardy laws meant there was no way they could try him again for the same crime. Mel had no idea about the developments in this case, and was going about his life as usual when the FBI grabbed him up. He was taken into custody and ordered to strip down to be photographed. He then threw a tantrum because there was a female agent in the room, but he was shown a court order forcing him to comply. He was then photographed so they could compare the images of his frickin' big hairy arse on him. And ironically, and this is weird, is that he was forced to pose in the positions he was in in the photographs. So, yeah, that's a hell of a time. Yeah. There was no doubt. They didn't need to do that. They just, they just they wanted, wanted to do, to do that. that. They were taking their own photographs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this is just for me. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> there was no doubt left that it was Mel in the images. And confronted by the new evidence, Mel Ignato finally confessed to the murder of Renda Schaefer. But he confessed, safe in the knowledge, that they couldn't try him again. Now, this is actually very similar to a video I made probably about six or eight months ago about the, the Tim Hennis. Hennis, he murdered Catherine Eastburn and her daughters in Fayetteville, North Carolina, back in 1985. He was initially found guilty of the murders, but then he was retried and he was found not guilty when they tried him a second time due to some faulty witness statements. When new DNA evidence, years, decades later, proved he actually did murder them after all, he couldn't be tried again because of the double jeopardy rule. But in this case, uh, Hennis, he was a former U.S. soldier, so he couldn't be tried in a civilian court, but he could be tried in a military court. So, uh, essentially, they tricked him back into being recalled for active service, and then they court-martialed him uh, in a military court, and he now is in life in prison. That's great. What a it was a really good trick they did, yeah. yeah. There's also a case in the U.K. of Dennis McGrory. McGrory was initially cleared of the murder of 15-year-old Jacqueline Montgomery in Islington, North London in 1975, only for new DNA evidence years later, with McGrory in his mid-70s to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was McGrory and no one else who committed the crime. The original case was thrown out by a judge before it ever reached trial in 1975, after the judge ruled the evidence offered by the prosecution was purely circumstantial. As a result, he was able to be retried and finally found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison, which was a life sentence for a man of his age. So I completely agree with the legal principle of double jeopardy. Mm -hmm. I get it. It makes sense. Like without without it, the government would prosecute someone just multiple times. Right, till they, they got it right. Exactly. Just again, again, again for, yeah, yeah. Get, get a new jury each time until they got the outcome that they wanted. Also, if anyone was found innocent, they just live in fear their whole life, thinking that at any moment they could be just brought back to trial again. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, in cases where there's cold, hard evidence that comes to light, mm -hmm. and they also get a confession like this, yeah. it just seems madness that they can't try him for murder. There has, there has to be a clause. There should be, yeah, like on a case-by-case -case kind of basis. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is overwhelming that he did it. Yeah, You yeah, should yeah. be able to retry him then. Yeah, yeah. Especially if he's admitting he did it. He's like, but he's like, yo, uh, Tom in his nose, being like, uh, I did it, but you can't fucking do anything. He admitted it, we've photographic back hair evidence exactly. what more do you want his <laughs> back hair comb over what more do you need <laughs> mel of course had been to trial and certainly hadn't been in the military so options were severely limited for the investigators who had him dead to rights but were now completely hamstrung by the fifth amendment protections of the constitution the best legal workaround they could come up with was to try him for the only other thing they could prove without a doubt that mel had committed perjury during his murder trial, he had lied under oath to both the FBI and a grand jury. Now, nowhere near as serious as the rape and brutal murder he had committed, but a crime nonetheless. So Mel was prosecuted for perjury and given the maximum sentence he could receive, with eight years and one month in prison. As he'd already served two years and had a year taken off for good behavior, he ultimately only served a little over five years, and he was released in 1997. But then, he was put straight back in the handcuffs and charged with perjury again. Because, as we mentioned before, you might recall, that back during the trial of Brenda's former employer, Dr. William Spaulding, when Dr. William Spaulding wrote an anonymous letter threatening Mel, 
Mel had stated in his sworn testimony that he hadn't killed Brenda and their relationship was actually really, really good and they were getting along great, which was a big fat lie under oath. And so Mel got another nine years in prison. He was finally released for good in 2006, having served a total of 14 years behind bars. For comparison, William Spaulding served three years for the letter he had sent threatening Mel, and Mary Shore served three years of a five-year sentence. So all in all, it's a pretty shitty outcome, and I don't think there's ever been a real justice for what happened to Brenda, but legally, that was the best they could get. And as he was being taken away, having been found guilty of perjury, Mel told Brenda's relatives at the trial, I assume total responsibility for what I did. What I did was wrong and horrible, and there are reasons, but I'm not going to get into that because there are no excuses. I just wanted to say to Brenda's family that I am very sorry this happened. I know all the pain and sorrow and suffering I've caused you. I felt it myself and I want to apologize to my own family for the same reason. I want to also apologize to all the law enforcement agencies and to the judicial system, local, county, state and federal, for all the grief and burden I've caused them. It was not my intent to do that. I just hope and pray that all of you will forgive me as I ask for forgiveness from God. And I hope there's some unknown way that God will bring about some good from this. Because I know the Bible says in all things, God works for the good of those who love. Which is real shitty thing to just fucking say. Which is like, hey, there's reasons for this. And, you know, I'm just sorry it all happened. And, uh, you know, just say, good old God, how about you forgive me? And God will too. And this will all be good. Sometimes it's best just not saying anything. He just acting like he's doing them all a favor. Mm. He doesn't really give a shit. It's not. It's just like he, he couldn't have written a more faker half apology, really. Once he was released... Mel moved back to the same area where he murdered Brenda. In fact, he lived a little over four miles away from where she'd been buried. But there's one final twist to this story. Mel would feel at least a small modicum of what he forced Brenda Shaver to endure. Because on the 1st of September 2008, Mel Ignato was found dead by one of his neighbours. He was found in a pool of his own blood, having fallen through a glass coffee table. The exact same kind of table he'd used as a platform to bind and torture Brenda years and years before. By all accounts, Mel was pretty much a complete pariah in his final two free years, and his health had gone to shit years earlier. His neighbor, Anthony Allen, said he clearly bled to death alone while desperately trying to get help. And, um, yeah. He died alone because everybody fucking hated the sick piece of shit that he was. Mary Ann Shore, meanwhile, she died aged 54 years old in 2004 from heart complications. But, I mean, that's pretty fitting because she fucking had no heart. So that's true, yeah. Good riddance to her, too. So there we go. Karma is best served on a shattered glass platter. I agree. I very much agree. Final thoughts? Uh, I guess, I don't know, if something breaks up with you. Don't be like Mel. <laughs> yeah, that's a, hey, couldn't have said it better myself. Don't be having any escapades, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> nice. Yeah. What a callback. <laughs> yeah. But there you go. That's the story of Mel Ignato, the man who got away, question mark, kind of, sort of got away with murder. A very brutal and horrific murder. Mm, he deserved much worse, but eh, he did. in the end, I guess, he got his. He got his. He did. He did. Uh, all right. Will, will we wrap it up? I think so. All yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you so much for listening, folks. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Shit, what am I supposed to say? I forgot how to do the intro. I haven't, we haven't actually recorded a proper podcast in a long time. So I'm like, I think oh, wait, last, how do I end this? <laughs> the last one we recorded, I think we tried to do it in the pub. And, uh, yeah, we did. I don't know how that turned out. I think, no, it's actually kind of fun. I think it's uh, that will come out as a bonus episode, the one we recorded in that pub in Boston. Okay. The audio was okay, was it? It was. It was okay. actually very listenable. Okay, uh, cool. Great. So it, for the folks at home who want to listen, it'll come out as a bonus episode. It won't be a weekly episode. It's. I don't think it's good enough to be a weekly episode because the quality, it's listenable and it's good, but it's like not it's like this. Yeah, which yeah. is very good in my opinion. If you want to feel like you're in a pub drinking with us while we're just shit talking, yeah, well, this is the episode. We for are you. talking about what we did in Salem though, <laughs> true, and yeah. like our trip to America and stuff like it's that, true, and all yeah. the stuff we. And you do spend about an hour telling the entire story of Salem. I got completely carried away. You yeah. did. I was like, he, I, I sat down with Keith in the bar, and was like, you know, we should just record a podcast and shoot the shit about our trip and all the stuff. We stayed in a haunted hotel and we were exploring it. We went to the Satanic Temple. We did lots of cool shit. Might make for an interesting episode. It's, you know, it's something fun. You, 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 and then you Keith did, decided you to take an say... hour to tell the whole story <laughs> of the Salem Witch Trials. You, you said it'd be 
interesting talk with the history. I, 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 yeah, I, I just ran with it. it. Yeah, I, I came then wrote, I had 10,000 words written out. Do you, know what I, do you know what it was? I read so much before, I just needed to get it out yeah. of me. I had all this knowledge inside me, and I was just like, I just need to get it out. just vomited yeah, words. Yeah, pretty uh, much, yeah. Well, here, listen, uh, look forward to that, folks, as a bonus episode sometime. Um, but yeah, here, listen, until then, please check out the That Chapter YouTube channel. New videos every Tuesday and on Fridays, so give them a go, talking true crime and all the usual stuff. 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Irish time. Um, and yeah, here, check out the That Chapter podcast. Okay, so I know the thing about the podcast is the schedules of when it's posted are kind of all over the place. I really want to start um, being a lot more consistent on when these podcasts are going live. So I'm going to aim just every Monday morning at a specific time is when I want to really start. Uh, I want to kind of start, stop faffing about and start making them like, okay, every Monday rather than, yeah, it's on Wednesday, it's on Tuesday, it's on yeah. this day. So Monday on your way to work. Yeah, there you go. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to stick to that. If I don't, feel free to give me shit about it. So that'll force me to. Um, but yeah, here, listen, thanks so much for listening. Uh, me and Keith would appreciate it. And yeah. All right. See ya. There you go. Keats classic. See ya. <laughs> All right. You've been great. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thinking of your cock ring. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those are the funny ones that goes around the balls. Dude. I don't know why I think they're so funny. <laughs> so elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Oh, Back to the story. Cock ring break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever wear a cock ring? No. No, me neither. Wink. <laughs> yeah.